you're here for the tour, come on in, we'll get started, please. My name is David Siegel and I'll be your tour guide here. A little bit about myself. I am a career firefighter paramedic with the Green Bay Metro Fire Department. I've been on Green Bay since 1997. In addition to being a firefighter, I've always been a history geek. Anyone else here a history geek? I like it. No, all right, geek is not a pejorative. That's actually a compliment, all right? I've but always I'm been a history person. As intense and as authentic as you are. All right. So I'm very much into history, and I combine that with my passion for the fire service. And a few years ago, I wrote a book on the history of the Green Bay Fire Department, the very early history of the fire department, from 1836 to 1895. Found out that Green Bay Fire Department's got a tremendous history. It's fascinating, because things didn't just happen. Things just didn't change. There were always these disastrous fires that went terribly wrong. The fire department, the community, the municipal officials said, let's not go through that again, and they changed accordingly. Now, I came up here to the uh, Door County Historical Museum several weeks ago to share with them my book, and uh, Ginny, the woman I met, brought me in here and said, would you like to see the collection? This is fantastic. And spontaneously, I started giving her a little description of each of these vehicles that were here, how they work. And she said, would you be interested in coming and giving, up, giving presentations to the public? So that's how I ended up here. So what I want to do is share with you the fire engines here. And we're going to go in chronological order for the engines that were here in Sturgeon Bay. But there are two underlying themes to keep in mind. For all of these engines, I'm going to show you where the water came from and where the power came to push the water. So keep that in mind, where the water came, came from and where the power came to push the water. All right. If you've got questions at any point, please feel free to ask. It's a great, if I don't know the answer, it's a great way for me to learn, for the museum to learn, to look up the answers. So what we'll do is we'll start on the far corner over there, so we can head on over there. Initially, firefighting in Sturgeon Bay was conducted by regular citizens using buckets. They'd fill the buckets from the fresh, uh, fresh water supply in the, uh, in the bay, lakes, or wells. And they would carry the buckets or pass the buckets and throw it on the fire. So the water was provided by buckets and the force to propel the water was by throwing. Horribly ineffective and inefficient. 1869, a schoolhouse burned down, which had burned down a year before. Bucket Brigade was ineffective, and the municipality said, all right, let's put together an organized firefighting force. So the Pioneer Fire Company was formed. They started looking at getting a fire engine, but it turns out they're very expensive. So a local carpenter named Dill Kimber, Dill Kimber, Dill Kimber, he built this hand pumper this very one. The wheels and the axles came from Fort Howard in Green Bay, the military garrison, and this pump right here was purchased in Chicago. 
Now this is called a hand pumper. It works, let's go back to the two things I want you to remember. Where's the water come from? Where does the power come from? The water comes from people with buckets of water dumping it into the open tub right here. And if you want to step forward to take a look, you're very welcome to. So they would pour buckets of water into the tub right here. And they would form a chain from the well or the lake or the bay. Now these long poles on each side are called brakes. And firefighters would line up about six on each side and move these brakes in an up-down motion. And this would work, this mechanism right here, which would draw the water into this piston and propel it out this discharge. There was a 100-foot hose that was supplied, and the firefighters would be at the fire spraying. It could only get to the top of about a story and a half roof, so it didn't go very far. But what a big improvement from throwing buckets of water. So again, the water supply comes from people, that's all right, people come from uh, uh, dumping buckets in here and firefighters in an up-down motion working these handles. Now there were 12 people or so at a time working this, but an individual could only last about five minutes and then they'd have to take a break. So six people on this side, six people on this side. Someone would come to this spot right here. Everyone would move down, and the person at the end would take a break. Five minutes later, another person would come in. They'd move down, take a break. So while they had 12 working the handles, the brakes, they had at least another 12 resting, waiting for their turn. Like what, what was so intense that they could last only five minutes? You can find out. Go ahead, grab that thing, go up and down for five minutes. Tell me what you think. So it's, it's, it's tiring. Okay. It's very tiring. The motion up, down, once every second. So about okay, 60 motions. I'm thinking of people at the Y now who are doing these things. Well, they didn't have uh, uh, power aid then. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, no, it was very tiring work. And one of the greatest dangers is while this handle is going up, down, someone jumps in here, getting their hand smashed. So manpower intensive, manpower demanding. Water supply was tough to achieve, and the amount of water and the distance of the water would flow was fairly limited. But it was better than buckets of water. This is the steamer fire engine that Sturgeon Bay got in 1881. And these steamer fire engines work just like a railway locomotive. The big barrel right here is a boiler. And on the back right here is a coal bin, and there is a burn box right there between the wheels. A firefighter would start a fire in there with kindling and then add chunks of coal. And here's the exhaust coming out of the boiler. This would heat water to a boil, which would move a mechanism, which would move a water pump. And that's what all of this material is here. So several things were overcome with the steamer. Instead of 12 and at least 12 resting, we now have one engineer and one stoker. One engineer turning valves, one stoker shoveling in coal. How long would it take to heat up? It all depends, and I don't know what they did in Sturgeon Bay. I know in Green Bay, when these steamers were at the station, they were hooked to a hot water heater. So hot water was constantly circulated. Yeah. I don't know if they did that in Sturgeon Bay. I know the few times that to save money during the summer, they shut off the hot water heater. It took excessively long to get to steam, which is the term, to get to steam. But there are videos from the early 1900s showing these going down the street, belching black smoke, and there's one guy in back, one arm on the rig, one arm throwing coal inside the burn box. So they would start the fire before they'd leave the station and feed it en route. But uh, with, with a good system of the uh, hot water heater, two minutes, three minutes to steam. Right. Now where did the source of water come from? Well, that's the next point to, uh, to address. 
This has a tremendous increase in water flow, that is volume that it could flow, several hundred gallons per minute, depending on the model, and I don't know which one this is. This picture shows how they increase that water supply. So here is the same steamer, and here is a large supply hose coming off of the dock into, I imagine that's the bay. This large hose right here. So they would park this on the dock, extend the supply hose into the bay, and have essentially an unlimited supply. So now they have overcome the manpower problem, the water volume problem, and the pressure this generated is actually fairly close to what we have today, whether it's Sturgeon Bay, Green Bay, or anywhere. What the city of Sturgeon Bay did, which happened I know in Green Bay, is they built underground cisterns wooden tanks that were at street level at major intersections. And in Sturgeon Bay, there were 14 of them. So if they're many blocks away from the bay, they would park the steamer at the cistern, open up a small access hatch, lower that supply line into the cistern, and have access to the water there. The largest cisterns I ever heard of were 30,000 gallons. That's a modern railway tank car. The ones in Sturgeon Bay were smaller, about the scale of 9,000 gallons, at least the few I have data on. These were incredibly successful, so much so that Sturgeon Bay got a second steamer as well. They held on to this, but it was essentially obsolete. One of the things I know that happened with uh, the hand pumpers versus the steamers is that crew would be working on the handles, doing this for five minutes, taking a break, doing this, and then they'd look over at the steamer and see one guy turning a valve, one guy shoveling coal, and people didn't want to work the brakes anymore. <laughs> Would asked about water supply, one of the unique things that Sturgeon Bay did is in 1905 they had a single water main extend from the bay up into the business district and all it was used was for water supply at fires. Just a single line. Uh, that was before a municipal service came in where every building had fresh water. This, I have to tell you, is an incredibly unique item. This is called a chemical pumper. And for this museum to have this is a unique thing. This was the next step in the evolution of fire engines after the steamer. And it really was an experiment that didn't pan out. Two ways of propelling the water. Firstly, and this is what makes it unique, are these tanks right here. These two tanks right here are full of water. And on top right here are screw mechanisms. When the firefighters would get to the scene, they would stop, and a firefighter would crank down this mechanism. Inside this steel tank right here, it would rupture vials of acid and sodium bicarbonate, essentially Alka-Seltzer. So what happens when you put Alka-Seltzer in water? Fizzes, right. And does anyone know what that fizzy is? CO2. Carbon dioxide, exactly, CO2. The same thing that makes soda or beer fizzy. All right, so that's what they're doing. And when they use acid, it really gets fizzy quick. So they would crank down these handles, break the acid. The acid would mix with the sodium bicarbonate. An incredible amount of carbon dioxide would be formed, but it was trapped inside the tanks. So now pressure would build up, and this, you know, this is probably about 80 gallons or so of water, is now under pressure. This hose reel right there was the high pressure hose. 
and they would unreel this and with very high pressure attack the fire. So this is the chemical part of the engine. They also thought that putting carbon dioxide inside the water made it a better suppression agent. Not true. It just made it seem like water or beer. Now these actually didn't last very long. Anyone know what happens to metal when it's in contact with acid? It corrodes. And that's what happened to these systems, is that the metal would become corroded. And these actually lasted for only a few years, from the early 20s into the, barely into the 30s. In fact, one of these tanks, when I got underneath, it's corroded underneath. Tough, impossible to tell if that's acid corrosion or if it's just regular uh, rusting corrosion. Well, how did they get the source of water? He said it hurt, held 80 gallons. Well, held 80 gallons, all right. So who here is a firefighter, former firefighter? All right, 80 gallons enough? It's a start though, isn't it? All right, so it's a start with 80 gallons. And that was the key to this, is that very quickly, they got the pressure and they got water on there. Oh, and then other engines would come? Nope. No. This also has a motorized pump. Now this is a gasoline engine, right? And this is the first motorized fire department or fire engine in Sturgeon Bay. So there is an engine here that powers the wheels. Well, the engine also powers a motorized pump that is right back here. And this opening right here is an inlet. And these big hoses would be attached here and could be draped over the dock or attached directly to a fire hydrant. There were fire hydrants in the 20s, yes. So now there's, again, unlimited water supply. So that's where the water comes from. And then a motorized pump that now provides the power. All right? So this is why it's called a chemical pumper. Chemical pumper. Dual function. Make sense? No one's catching me on making up anything yet? All right. This is incredibly unique to have a chemical pumper in a collection because most of them went away because they, they just were unsuccessful. Another big reason why uh, fire engines are rare, and this is particularly true of the steamers, is that the scrap metal drives of World War I and World War II you know, World War I, the steamers were becoming obsolete, and by World War II, they definitely were. And faced with the massive metal demands of World War I and World War II, a tremendous number of fire engines were scrapped when they became obsolete. And uh, steamer fire engines in particular are rare, chemical engines also. In fact, all of Green Bay steamer engines are gone, uh, scrap metal drives. Okay. So now we're going to move to the next evolution, which is on the far side. There are different types of chemicals that are used to fight fire, anything from carbon tetrachloride to foam, halogens. Yep. But it's just interesting to, I mean, not that that thing is that, but the idea of using Actually, it's very old. They're, uh, in the display case over here, there are glass bul uh, bulbs. Those are what's known as fire extinguishing grenades. And they would take the, gr the glass bulb, throw it, and break it at the fire. The chemical that's in there is called carbon tetrachloride. And what carbon tetrachloride does is it stops the chemical reaction that is fire. That's how chemical agents work. The problem is carbon tetrachloride is very toxic by itself, and in particular, the gas is giving off when it burns or when it's exposed to heat is also very toxic, carcinogenic. There are much more modern forms of that. A halogen is one, but that's become a, a developed into obsolescence. But there are lots of chemical agents out there. Someone, yeah. 
All right, so this is the 1926. Is that what it says on front? All right, good, I got that right. So now this is a pure motorized pumper. Internal combustion engine that's got a drivetrain that powers the rear wheels. This, this one's in great shape. And you can take a look at this and see all the mechanisms that make sense in terms of it driving down the road. Well, there also is a lever right here that engages the pump. This will be very familiar to anyone that's worked with a modern engine. What that does is it takes the drive shaft that normally powers the wheels, disengages that, but now engages a motorized pump. That motorized pump is right back here, and right here is just like on the previous one, a chemical inlet, or excuse me, a water inlet. The big hoses would be attached here, put into the bay, or attached to a hydrant. The difference between these two is six years later, they're not even messing with the chemicals, the use of the acids and the bicarb. This is purely motorized. Outlets here and on the other side, and now there's a hose bed on the back, and if you go around backside when we're done here, you'll be able to see there's a tremendous amount of hose. So this is purely motorized. 1936, Sturgeon Bay bought this FWD, which is actually made in Clintonville. The evolutionary step here is that this has, right back here, 150 gallons of water. All right? How's that compared to today's pumpers? Standard is about 750 gallons. That's what ours carry. But now, just like the chemical pumper, there's a little bit of a water supply there to start the attack. Because frankly, if you can't put down a, a house fire with 150 gallons, you're going to lose the house. But this also has inlets on this side, inlets on that side, and again, would make the connection to either a hydrant or off the dock, drawing water from the bay. Much more powerful engine, which supplies the power. Again, the power from the engine drives a shaft that normally drives the wheels, but now drives a pump that is just behind the cab. And there's Val, I take a look at an engine, and I'm sure you guys can as well. This looks just like what I drive today. This app, I mean, everything makes sense. Every lever, every knob, I know what that does. I'm not going to move it, but I know what it does. Right? So that's the evolution of fire engines in Sturgeon Bay. And again, let's go back to the idea of where the water came from and where the power came from. Buckets of water and arm motion cisterns in the bay, coal-powered steam, chemical motorized from hydrants or the bay, Mo purely motorized hydrants or the bay, a tank, hydrants or the bay, and massively motorized. I bet this thing can do as well as a current.